Reggie Ford. What an impressive, impressive young man. His whole childhood was, was poverty. His father was put away, uh, was incarcerated. He was, his mother was a teenage mother. Uh, you know, he, he had to deal with poverty and many of the constraints and bad environments there uh, turned it completely around. Had a very good education, MBA, went to business school. He is now an entrepreneur. He does public speaking. He has a wealth management company. Uh, he wrote a great book uh, where he talks about, um, it's, it's called PTSD, Perseverance Through Severe Dysfunction, Breaking the Curse of Intergenerational Trauma as a Black Man in America. It's a fascinating read. He started, he talks about how he did it. He was journaling and uh, through tough times with his grandmother. Uh, he has a top 10 list of, of items, of elements needed to run a successful business. Uh, and I'll just tease you with the first, if you like, and it's follow your passion. But we go through all 10 uh, in detail. And it's, it's excellent. His video, t one of his videos on his YouTube talks about it, but I really enjoyed talking to Reggie. He, he gives me energy, you know, he meditates, he does yoga, he, he journals, uh, he's an inspiring, inspiring young man. And not only did he turn it around, turn his life around, but now he feels that all those people that helped him turn it around, he feels he owes it to them to help others. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Joey Pins. People ask me, how did I lose 130 pounds? The quick answer is always discipline. I started my business, wasn't paying attention to my health, was eating too much, you know, drinking too much sweets. My daughter was born. Next thing I know, I'm pre-diabetic, I have hypertension. I knew something had to change, discipline. I, like many of you, have faced many challenges in your career, in your family, in your life faith. How did you attack them? How did you approach them? How did you solve them? Hopefully it all had to have some degree of discipline. I'm also asked, how did you found and start a tech business that lasted over 25 years? Discipline. I was committed to it, enjoyed technology, didn't enjoy some aspects of it, but knew it was necessary. Discipline. Our podcast mission, how do we use discipline to better ourselves and society? Join me, please, as I talk to interesting people and discuss how they use discipline in their family and their passion and their careers and how it helped them. Our podcast vision, growth through learning from others. Joey Pins Discipline Conversations. It will be light and serious. Join us, please. Thank you for consideration. Before, thank you so much for doing this. I really, really appreciate your time. How is it that, you know, I get to, I get to talk to some very interesting people, much like yourself. And not only do you turn around the, you know, the, the, the you had a father, there was an issue there. He wasn't around. Your mother was young. You, you were in a poor environment when you were growing up, but not only do you turn it around and be as successful as you are now an author, an entrepreneur, a public speaker, uh, excellent public speaking, by the way, but how do you, what makes you want to get the lessons that you've learned and help others make that turn around as well? That's very rare and, and applaudable. I appreciate that. I, I really do. And I think it, I think it boils down to recognizing the impact that others had on me. Like I, I, I've done a lot of things and I've put in a lot of work to get to where I'm at, but I don't believe that those efforts were mine alone. I think other people hmm. contributed to the, the quote unquote success that I've had to the life that I've lived in, in the experience that I've had. And so I think it would be selfish for me um, and sometimes selfish can be a good thing, but I think in, in this regard, uh, there is, we all have talents. I, I'm, I'm one to believe that we all have unique talents and whether it is working with your hands, whether it is speaking, whether it is something totally, you know, different, um, it's, it's, it's our ability. It's up to us to share those talents with the world or else 
there's this zero sum game with with you know individuals on the world and i i don't think that we were sent here to just benefit ourselves and so um i learned something i try to pass it down or uh, if i made a mistake i try to prevent someone from making that mistake or going through that pain and so that's just i think that's how i'm wired but i think that's how i think that's the reason we are here together it's fascinating. So the advice that you got and the motivation you received to better yourself, you feel you owe that to spread that to others. That's, that's very, very, my goodness, Reg, <laughs> imagine if the world adopted that theory. Yeah, I wish, I wish, I wish we could get out of our own way and put ego aside at times for the betterment of, of us all, because I think that would then be even better. I think it would end up with more productivity with more innovation with more everything if we actually came together as that collective helping each other out passing down knowledge um, but sometimes it isn't how it plays out yeah sometimes our own ego like you said gets in the way it's 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 horrible and then you be you become an entrepreneur i mean i mean you're very well educated you got your mba i, I believe uh and you become an entrepreneur you and you have like these 10 lessons you know if i had these 10 lessons when i started my company many uh, follow your passion surround yourself with a great team uh, you know it, it goes on i'd like to talk about each of them i mean as far as your passion you talk about you know the old the old adage if you do what you like you never have to work again you know so do something you like did, did you find your passion i think I think passions evolve over time. I think through mm. life experiences, through the ups and downs that we have, I think they evolve. And I think I've, I've found passions and that my passions have also evolved and I'm walking into newer passions. And so I, I, I always, you know, in, in my book, I write um, the process of perseverance. It's from pain to passion, passion to purpose, purpose to power, power to peace. That's the process wow. of perseverance. And so at the beginning of that, though, is pain, right? It, it's some pain. It's some annoyance. It's something uncomfortable that you have to experience. And for me in my life, it was poverty. That was the first big pain point that was just sticking out at me that I could do something about. And so that meant becoming financially stable for myself. That meant becoming uh, a person who others could turn to. And that's why I started a career in finance and accounting and then started a wealth management company. And then, like I said, those passions evolve with life and uh, through life, you know, mental health became such a huge part of my life and social justice became a huge part of my life. And that's where a lot of the book surrounds. And then that leads to the speaking and the empowerment and the things that I do on that front. And so I would say, um, absolutely. I've, I've found my passion. Uh, hmm. I know for some people it's very difficult. Um, I, I know some younger folks that I mentor and I ask them what they like, and it, it's very hard to get them to even think about one thing that they like. But I think if you, if you go back to why you wake up in the morning, um, I think it'll, it'll lead you to that. And, hmm. you know, for me, it goes back to some of those pain points. Yeah. So often we see with the youth is, um, you know, what do you like? What do you mm -hmm. like doing? I mean, just finding that passion and you, you did it. You, you know, um, one, one of your, one of your points at number four was, you know, study accounting, financing and, or finance and marketing, yeah. you know, just to get, get a basic kind of foundation of running a business. And then through that, you kind of found your passion. And the other one, the second one, surround yourself with a great team. I mean, that's so important. Did you, did you have a, did you have bad people that you had to move out and turn in and out? How did that, how would that evolve? Um, and the, the list you're reading from, is that from a, uh, I'm trying to remember that. Is that a speaking something found that I, where I was speaking? Yeah. Okay, you, okay. This is on your YouTube. Okay. 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 This is on your YouTube. Uh, about nine months ago, gotcha. you kind of gave a list. Gotcha. Of, uh, oh yes. It was yeah. for a graduating class of this entrepreneurial um, program. And so, yes, but for the team piece, I think, I think that also translates to just life in general, but mm. um, I, I, the, the old adage, you become the average of the five people you hang out with most. Right. And I just, I've seen that in my life. 
where I was in an environment where I could have easily gone down a different path. Um, friends that were turned into gangs, turned into the drug life, turned into different things like that. Um, I would hang out with the athletes and the folks that were getting their homework done and things like that. And, and, and you mm. start to see those, the, that the people that you surround yourself with are going to, how they behave and how they think is going to wear, wear on you somehow. And over time, that compounds on itself. So if you got a bunch of positive things being fed to you by the group that's around you, then hmm. that's positivity coming out of you. But on the other end, if it's a, a lot of negativity or a lot of things that you don't want to see yourself become, um, then it compounds on itself the same way. And so in business or in as a team, it's who who surround yourself with folks that all have a aligned vision. How do you work together, complement each other to get to that place? And I think again, same, same metaphor with life. Like this is a, this is something that we're getting to a destination, wh whatever that is. Peace and happiness uh, is the one that I hope that we're all striving toward. But mm. if you um, are around people who aren't aligned in that vision, then I think you ought to separate yourself from them. Yeah. Well put. And that, that goes beyond the business. It just goes beyond being social as well. I think there's the old Bible verse, bad associations spoil useful habits. Mm. Yeah. And uh, that gets carried over well. Um, uh, you also talk about being a good leader. You know, I, I, I like to talk to business people about the difference between being a leader and being a manager. Mm. I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. Oh, that that's, that's great. I think so. Being a good leader in my eyes, I, I, I feel like it is more about listening. It's more about actually following those who are following you because a good leader is going to put the right people in place to do the things that they need to do, that they're great at doing. Whereas a manager, and, and I'm just coming up with this off the spot, but you know, they are, they see leadership as they have to have their hand in all of those pieces that are, that are being hmm. operated in. And I think that, you know, there's a time and a place for certain things like that, you know, training folks who need to, who need help and assistance to get to the level of proficiency. But at some point, a leader is going to let the people that they're leading go and do what they do. And, um, and, and do a, doing a lot of listening and understanding and communicating. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I prefer leaders. I prefer to work with uh, mm. leaders if if I'm if I'm being led um, as opposed to a, man, a manager. Um, I we have so many resources at our fingertips that if a person who is being led um, gets a directive and knows where those resources are, I feel like they can accomplish anything. And so I think you know, leaders sometimes just got to step out of the way and let the people doing what they do, do it. Very interesting. And yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think kind of managers work on the day to day, setting goals, reaching goals, whereas leaders are more global, you know, where are we going as a direction? You know, it's a, uh, I, I think many managers think they're leaders and I think many leaders are really managers, mm. you know, so I, yeah. I got to kind of, move that around. Another really good point that you make that I really enjoy is take care of your personal finances first. Yes. All too often we see these companies running out of money very quickly. Uh, and you know, they're, you know, they're using their own money. And did you have personal experience there? I was always very frugal. I mean, going back to that pain point of starting off in poverty it, it, from a young age, I just, I, I knew I, I didn't want to feel broke. And, and that meant that was relative, you know, so when I was younger, if I had a hundred dollars, like I'm good, but uh, you know, I know what my spending habits are and things like that. And mm. now, you know, so I've always taken care of my personal finances to where there were, weren't a worry for me in the, in the life that I was living. Uh, but I see, I've seen so many people struggle with that or go out and start a business and can't afford their mortgage or their rent. Right. And the business crumbles at that point. It could be a brilliant idea. It could be a brilliant product or whatever. Um, but if, if you're stressing about where you're sleeping then, or what you're eating and then the business takes suffers. And so 
uh, I think it's just important to to eliminate things that you can prevent, eliminate the worries if you can prevent them. Yeah, it's very important. I mean, you know, it's hard to start a business. 50% fail in the first, what is it, three years or something? You know, I started my business and I was, you know, I was still living with my parents. I didn't have, you know, I didn't have to pay any rent. I didn't have that mortgage. I didn't get an expensive car purposely. I, you know, I, I wanted to put everything through as a business. And if, yeah, if you can't pay your mortgage, you can't live anywhere. It's a very, very, very tough. And, um, all too often, this is a kind of where society was where uh, it pushes us to be in debt all the time, mm -hmm. you know, with credit cards and students come out with a lot of debt, with school debt, with it's, uh, so managing your money is, is really important to develop those skills. Your next point of being a lifetime learner all too often, I just, you know, I, I talk to executives and they just, they seem to have no questions, but have a lot of answers. <laughs> and I always worry about that. Mm -hmm. I, I always, yeah, I, 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 that annoys me with people. Yes. <laughs> I think folks who, uh, know it all, it, um, it just, it, it's off putting because it, you can't know one of my favorite quotes from first time I, I think I heard it in college, maybe, uh, Socrates, it was the only true wisdom is in knowing we know nothing huh. and you know, saying, saying, you know, the wise are the ones that, you know, go about life in a way that they know nothing, right? I'm always learning because there's a whole universe of things out there that I have no clue about. No one can be an expert at everything. And so um, I, I, I love, I, I, th I think I'll couple learning and creativity in, in kind of the same bucket just for this conversation. And um to, to be creative and to co constantly be learning is, is personal development, is personal growth. Yes. And so I, I, I'm, I'm like right now, oh, this is a great day. I just passed 100 days straight on Duolingo. I'm studying Spanish. And Congratulations. So, thank you. I appreciate that. So learning a new language, um, learning skills with, with, you know, YouTube, you know, that you can learn anything on YouTube, uh, Udemy, Coursera, things like that. I'm, I'm always trying to learn a new skill, learn something. I think it helps in uh, just your everyday life, but also in uh, whether it's business, whether it is a new endeavor that you're trying to accomplish. I think it, it's, it's helpful for all those things. And then it helps with just connecting with more people, the more things that you are able to learn, or you know, if you're just curious about it, now you can have a conversation with someone from a different standpoint than if you're just in the blind. And so, uh, I think, you know, a lifetime learner goes back to, you know, listening, you know, uh, you, you can't, you can't know it all. So you have to listen, you have to ask questions. And I think that, uh, is, is a hum uh, humbling aspect to it all. Yeah. And your first quote about Socrates, you know, admitting, you know, nothing. I mean, he invented the Socratic method with <laughs> his learning by questions. Yeah. You learn by asking questions. Absolutely. Uh, and it, 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 it's just so vital. Uh, your next one in your, your, your top 10, you know, uh, of ways to become a great entrepreneur, which I still don't do. And I need <laughs> to do it. My goodness. I, you know, I started my business back in 93 It's there, and I still don't do this It's celebrate tiny victories. Yes. I just, I don't, I, I just get a victory that I move on. Yes. I have to stop and just take a breath. I mean, it's just very important. Mm -hmm. It is. And, and hopefully one of these days I'll get to share a, a, talk on a stage um if they invite me to come talk about it but it's about it's about those things it's about celebrating um those tiny victories it's about how you define success because success can be defined in so many different ways and Absolutely. if you have this grand expectation down the line whatever you may or may not get to that point and so you may or may not ever feel true satisfaction from all the things that you've done up to that point and this, this may, I, I literally was just thinking about that. I got a massage yesterday and this is, this is a fresh thought. So bear with me, but Please. I was, I was in the middle of the massage and I was, I was getting impatient because I wanted certain part of my body worked or worked harder or something like that. And I thought if I go through this whole massage and I'm constantly having that thought process, I'm not going to enjoy the mm. massage. So why not? Mm enjoy the moment, enjoy where 
the mas massage therapist is on my body right now and, and really hone in on that. And then when they move, enjoy that piece. And, and then you come out with a great experience instead of sitting there thinking like, man, I can't wait till they get to, you know, my hamstring. I can't wait. No, it's like, oh man, that's, I needed that right there. I feel that. And so I think that's the same kind of mentality yeah. when you go to, you know, celebrating those little victories. It's, you know, um, I didn't get the million dollar account, but I did get that $10,000 account. Let's, you know, I'm, and I'm not talking about a whole blowout party or anything like that, but right. stop and take honest, take, take note of that and right. celebrate that because, you know, there is a, a younger version. I always, I always, this is what helps me. I bring it back to a younger version of me. All the things that I'm doing now, that younger person is proud of. So if I'm sitting here saying, man, I didn't get the, the speaking fee I thought I was going to get, or I didn't get the client that I thought I was going to get, that, that's newer ver this newer version of mm. me who's had these different levels of success. But if I take it back to that younger person, it's like, what are you talking about? Like, let's go. <laughs> so hmm. I, uh, I think, yeah, you got to celebrate them. You got to, you got to, because it's going to keep you going. It's going to keep you going to that next one. And again, everything I think boils down to habits, the habits that you form, and then they compound on itself, right? $1, $10, $1,000, 1000000 like it, it compounds on itself. Um, so yeah, celebrating them when they come. Seems so simple, but it 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 means it means a lot, and it it helps you you know relax, set your next goal. Uh, your next one realize that you will make mistakes, so it's kind of a fail, but fail fast, yeah. right, and move on. Yeah, fail, fail fast, fail forward, right, right, right. All of those. I, I I like I like all of that. So yeah, you're gonna make mistakes. Going back to to you know Socrates, you don't know it all. You're going to get in a situation where it might be the first time you've had to deal with something. Uh, you might not have the proper counsel. You might not, you know, have tapped into the right resources and that's okay. Right. Like most mistakes can be corrected. Owning. And this is another point about leaders. I love leaders who can own up to the mistakes that they've made mm. and take that onto themselves as opposed to putting it out on the team. Well, so-and-so didn't, a, a leader's going to say, I failed to communicate this. I felt I, you know, it was a mistake that the, that the leader made. And, um, so yeah, I mean, like mistakes are going to happen. 99% of them are correctable, uh, own up to it, learn from it and keep moving. The worst thing to do is to make a mistake repeatedly and keep on making the right. same mistake. Uh, that is, that's insanity at that point. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, I just make mistakes, make them fast, make them falling forward. And yeah. Very, very true. Make time for your family and friends. You can't mm. forget about the people mm. who love you. Mm. Absolutely. I have a, I had a mentor, wrote a book and he used this analogy of, um, four eyes on a, on the top of a stove burning and said that, you know, there, one of them is work. One of them is family. One of them is your health. And let's say the other one is friends. I'm, I'm, I don't know if family and friends were coupled or what. But out of those four in his life and from his perspective, he said three of those can go full tilt at all times. But you're going to hmm. sacrifice on one. So if you're crushing it in your business and you're crushing it in family and friends, your health might be lacking. Or, you know, mm -hmm. just move around. Like one of those things might be lacking or having to sacrifice. And I, I, I think I think all four can be burning and, and be going at a, at a good pace. And I think that's the, the ultimate challenge of life is to how do you, and I think that there, you know, I'll add more categories to that, but I think that all of those things can be working in harmony if you find the balance that is right for you and your personal life. Uh, but family and, and friends, like, this is, this is to the entrepreneur who is all about going out to make the most successful business. Oftentimes, the people that they love and who love them get the back seat. And to get to the mm. top of the mountain and have nobody around you is not the goal. It is absolutely not the goal. And that is something where, like, in my personal life, and I speak about this in my book, uh, you know, I've lost a lot of my close family. Um, 
I've replaced my family with with friends who I now consider family. But mm. uh, you know, sometimes the the success isn't as sweet when you look around and the people that you want to be there aren't there. And so I would hate for any entrepreneur, any person to achieve all the things that their heart desired without having the people around them that they truly love. And so it's, it, you got to prioritize that. Well, well said. So, and the, your last one is take care of your mental health, which goes right into your book that you've mentioned before, PTSD, Perseverance Through Severe Dysfunction, Breaking the Curse of inter Intergenerational Trauma as a Black Man in America. A fascinating read, Reggie. What led you to that? Thank you. I appreciate that. And again, going back to that, that question about passion, it, it, it started mm -hmm. with pain, it started with a lot of pain. I think you can hear that from the title and uh, pain from my entire life, childhood trauma, adult trauma. Um, but acutely it was a situation where my grandmother, who was my, my rock, my confidant, um, the, the peace that I needed in, in a lot of the chaos that I had in my life, uh, she was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. And in order to deal with that, I started journaling because all of my other coping mechanisms just weren't working or <laughs> it fell out of the window. And so I started journaling while, you know, all the different things that were happening and a lot of things were happening with her health, with relationships, with different family members. And it just, it became so much. It was, it was true chaos. And I, I just kept doing it. That was my routine. I would take care of grandma. I would try to do some work and I would journal. That was kind of my routine. And let me, let me back up a little bit. I was about six months into starting my business, six months into marriage. Uh, it was, it was that. And, and I had, you know, my mom and my father, we had some adversarial relationship things happening and and, and so it was a lot all at that moment. And I just kept journaling. And but before I knew it, I had had 60 pages of, of things, of stream of consciousness, of random life. And I decided wow. to just keep writing. And that was, that was six months of writing. And I, I, I decided to keep writing, going back to the things that I could remember from a young age all the way up to the point that I was at. And it, it took some some crafting and some editing, but it became the the book that it is. So yeah. So you had no intention of writing a book. It's just journaling turned into it. Yeah, no intention at not not at that moment. Not at I think I was twenty nine. Um, I didn't I, I didn't intend on writing a book. Uh, honestly, even after I decided to keep writing, it wasn't in it wasn't to write a book. It was just because it was so therapeutic for me. But I would sit down with folks and I, I, I stopped hiding behind, you know, this, this, this perfection, this, 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 you know, persona that I was putting out to the world. And I would just open up about the stuff that I was dealing with at the time. And some of the folks who knew a little bit about my past, who, um, you know, knew where I was currently, uh, were amazed at just that in, it, in itself, right, to go from from poverty to then be this successful entrepreneur and all the things that I had done educationally, occupationally, um, that alone, they said, could have been a book. And hmm. I'm like, it's just life for me. But then telling people the things that were happening at that moment, you know, I'm leaving this meeting to go give my grandmother her insulin shots and, and you know, all of this stuff. Um, I started to connect with people. I started to connect with people on a totally different level and people who I had known for 10 plus years, 20 plus years in some cases. And uh, it, it was genuine. It was authentic. It was raw. It was real. And that's what I want. That's what I like. I don't, I don't like the small talk. I don't like the, I don't too much care for that. And so hmm. to get on that level with people, it was, it was, it was a, a total shift, but it was one that I was appreciative of. And that's when I knew it could help the book could help other people dealing with family dysfunction, dealing with their own mental health issues, dealing with, 
you know, trauma from all walks of life. And, and that's what it's done, which has been amazing. It's, it's, it's been amazing. How much do you contribute your success and your, your positivity to yoga? Oh, so I found yoga kind of, I wouldn't say late in life, not late at all, but, but how many years now? It's been about seven years. So, um, I had already been on, you know, a very positive outlook type of, you know, trajectory, um, was moving in, in the trajectory of a lot of the things that I'm doing now, but yoga, it, it, it did, it, it started to shift things in my brain and shift thing and shift my perspective on things without me even mm -hmm. knowing it. And uh, you know, I went from reacting to certain situations to, you know, thinking and responding. And that was huge. And I, and there were other things coupled with that, that I, that I began to adopt in my life. But, but I think yoga played a huge role in being able to deal with the discomfort, deal with the chaos and not respond and not react the way that I would have at a younger age, which was oftentimes violence. And it, I, I, I read, I read, uh, the body keeps the score and that is a phenomenal book, uh, about, you know, trauma and how it lingers in your body and in your mind. And I was reading where, where Dr. Vander Kolk was talking about yoga. And I'm like, I've experienced all of these things and I didn't know that they were going on at the time. Wow. Right. And, and he, he describes yoga as being in an, or he describes trauma as your body and your mind being in an intolerable state, a state of, of hmm. discomfort, a state of, you know, true agony. And through yoga, for instance, it gives you, it, it, it gives your mind this trick that through this, you know, uncomfortable, this awkward position, we're going to breathe and then it's going to be over. And so all of those things are temporary. And so you do that on repeat um, and it starts to, again, like it's a brain trick because your brain can't always tell the difference between, you know, true harm or harm that's happening now versus harm that used to happen and like all of those different things. And so if you can trick your brain into thinking this craziness that I'm going through right now is going to end and it does, then you can start to apply those methods to different parts of your life. Do you meditate, Reggie? Every day. Every single day. So you do yoga and meditation. Were you meditating before yoga? I was not. No. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, was, I say not. In, well, I, I think meditation is, is all intentional. So I couldn't say I was unintentionally meditating. That wouldn't make sense to me. But um, yeah, I, I started meditating after yoga. And I often do it when I, when I do it in the mornings. And then I often do it when I'm like feeling most anxious in a day. And it might be when mm. everything is piling up and I'm feeling the busiest in a day, uh, which is counterintuitive. You think I need to get stuff done, but I'm like, nope, right. I need to first, I'll make a list of what's, you know, making me feel this way. And then I just put that aside. I just lay there or I just sit there and I start to meditate. And so, yeah, I, I've started, I, I've probably been about five or five or seven years of meditating and wow. yoga. Um, and it has been, you know, life changing, absolutely life changing. Hmm. And I, and, and I think, you know, meditation is, is tough for folks who are anxious or who, whose mind never stops. And they think that it's about shutting the mind off. Our minds aren't, aren't, you know, evolved to shut off. They're not going to shut off. There's always going to be something. It's about that, that intentionality. It's about being mindful of what it is coming to your mind. And then seeing if you can, you know, focus your attention on something that you can create, whether it be a blue bucket. Like every time that thought about work comes to my head, now I'm going to think about a blue bucket. Forget the work, <laughs> blue bucket. Forget the work, blue bucket, right? It doesn't have to be complete silence in your head because I don't think that some people say it's achievable, but I don't really know. And do you still journal? Yes. Yes. And I took, a, wow. I took, a, I took some time off from that after the book. I, it's funny when I was writing the book, I had these thoughts that just like would just scream at me at night if I was laying down or something. So I, I knew the book wasn't complete. So I'd get up and I'd write something down. I'd be like, all right, make sure I get this in there. Make sure. I'd... And, 
And then one night, it just like it was silent. And I didn't have, I didn't hear anything else in my head. And I was like, okay, it's done. I've taken all the things out. I didn't want in there. I put all the things in there I did. And, and I sat on that for a while and I kept feeling here, like not hearing the the words. And so I knew it was done. And then after the book was published, I, I, um, I took a while off from, from writing anything. And, um, I guess several months ago, I picked back up in journaling not with any particular focus or anything like that, but just, you know, it's something that helps me. So you journal, meditate, and do yoga almost every day? Uh, I don't do yoga every day. I was doing every day, but uh, but meditation and, and journaling pretty much every day. Wow. Yeah. And I walk. I, I might do a walking meditation some days, uh, but I walk um, with, my, with my puppy. She's around here somewhere. That's right, Rosie. Yeah, Rosie. I say yeah. puppy. She's a she's a three year old big old dog now. <laughs> so on the podcast, we talk a lot about uh, a discipline. You know, I lost a lot of weight, and mm -hmm. people ask me how how did I do it. I always say discipline and focus. I, I have you. Do you consider yourself disciplined? Have you always? Yes, I, I do, and I think I think that I'm trying to see if it was chicken or egg, but but sports definitely help with that. So mm. I play sports, um, you know, organized sports from 10 on um, and uh, started with football, basketball, or track. Or, well, th those are my sports, football, basketball, and track. And so I was busy throughout every season in school and everything like that. Um, and with, with, with those sports, especially football, you know, if you, if, you, I, if, you listen to, if you watch a football game on silence and just see the structure of football, mm from the, the line of scrimmage to, you know, motion, everything is so structured and that's how practices are. That's how preparation is. That's how everything is when it comes to that sport. And you have to be disciplined or else your help, you're going to get your helmet knocked off and you're going to get hurt. Mm. And so I think it, it, it was, if it, if it didn't start before that, it was definitely fostered through sports. And it's just, it's a matter of, of, like I said, coming back to the, the habits, the small things, doing the small things. I had a coach in, uh, in college who, uh, James Franklin, amazing coach. He's now at Penn State. And when he came to the program, we were, we were a little loose. <laughs> we were a little loose, uh, less disciplined than, than what he turned us into. And it was a lot of the sports tiny, tiny things that you probably wouldn't even think about to, you know, when we came to the locker room, when you put your clothes up, it's, it's helmet over here, it's shoes over here, both things pointed facing in and, and, and your uh, laces tucked into the shoes, right? Something as small as that, right? So if, right. if we're walking around and you see some laces hanging out or a shoe turned to the left, oh man, we're going to have to pay for that. And so, you know, going, you know, and so now, you, you take that to the practice field. It's like you take two steps to the right. Don't take three. Don't take two and a half. Don't take one and a half. You take two steps to the right. And that's going to get you in the place where you need to be. And so like all of those little things from football, from sports, uh, bled over into, all right, I'm going to create a process and I'm going to follow that process. Whether I get the results or not today, it doesn't matter because I know this process works and I'm going to continue this until one day you look up and you've done all these things. You've written a book, you've started a company, you've done these things, right? It just, it's about habits, process, and, and sticking to it, even when you don't see the rewards, even when there are tough days. Very, very, so you, do you think you got most of your discipline through sports? How about before 10 years old? Did you find yourself being self-disciplined? I was, I was, and, and I think, I'll attribute that to to fear, <laughs> fear uh, from my mom. Consequence, yeah. Really. Uh, I think I think I I I I'm a believer that you know positive reward is a better better way of of doing things rather than you know punishment. But for me, and uh, again, this is part of the trauma that I'm unpacking as, as an adult. But uh, you know, it became this this people pleaser type of thing where hmm. I didn't want to disappoint my mom. I didn't want to disappoint anyone. And so I was, I was making straight A's from the time my, my pen, my hand touched a pencil in school and that stayed that way. 
I would never get in trouble at school. I, you know, all of those things, right? I would, I would, I would, I was, I was really good at f what I believe school is, is a bunch of pattern recognition. <laughs> what I think everything is, is a bunch of pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. I understood the patterns and I, and I was able to regurgitate them and I was really good at that. And so I, I did really well. Uh, I, I guess you could say I was disciplined, but a lot of things came really easily to me. And, um, and so I don't know if it, if that would have caught up to me when things got difficult. Um, but I mean, things did get difficult. Um, and I, I think I did pretty well. So, so yes, I would say so. <laughs> and now throughout your adult life, you know, I get a lot of a pushback, Reggie, on discipline. I hear people saying, well, you need more compassion than you need discipline or, you know, and I don't think discipline is the end all, by the way, it's just something I happen to use that I feel that I use to lose a lot of weight. And I, I use it, you know, sparingly these days. So it's not like I'm an advocate and it must be administered all the time. I just think it's an essential ingredient, but I wonder how you as you know, in your public speaking, in your authorship, in, in, in your entrepreneurship, uh, is it something that you feel that's important for your, your staff, your, your clients, your, uh, your leadership? I think it is. And, and to say end all be all, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know which, what trait would be the greatest to have over mm. everything. I, I, I don't, I wouldn't say, uh, I, I can't speak on that, but I do think discipline is a thread that needs to run through every piece of that, every aspect of life. Um, and, you know, for instance, in wealth management, you know, talking with people about finances, finances is, is a, you know, when, once you get to a point where the income is, is a, a, at a level that is not just sustained, but, you know, able to grow and you can grow and grow and grow. And there's, there's potential there. Um, you can make a million dollars and spend a million dollars. Right. Hmm. It's not about the income side if you don't have discipline on the expense side. Um, you know, in sports, it's, it, it's definitely there. Uh, in, in family life, like you, you can easily if you don't have this, like a lot of people working from home now. Right. And, and, and home and, and work get blurred all the time. But you to have the discipline to set aside the time that is allocated to work and set aside the time that's allocated to family uh, takes discipline. All of it takes discipline. And so. Um, I think it is a absolute critical trait to have one person that I think is probably the most disciplined, um, to, to a fault. I can't say to a fault, but I don't think it's necessarily healthy is, um, David Goggins. And I don't know if you know, it's funny <laughs> you say that. Yes. He, uh, reading his book where it can't hurt me. It, yes. It, I mean, you one, I, I'm coming because I'm coming from it. I'm like, this guy has childhood trauma, right? I yes. think childhood trauma explains a lot of the behavior that we adopt as adults. And so I see his trauma and I see, you know, through what he's told us, um, how he's responded to that. And I, I can't say that I think it's necessarily healthy, but it has allowed him to do some unbelievable things. And Absolutely. so if you take... David Goggins on the extreme side over here mm. with discipline versus um, the person who won't wash a dish and only use his paper <laughs> plates, even though they can afford dishes just because they're lazy. And, right. you know, I think it's somewhere in between there. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, you need discipline in every single thing you do in life. I saw a recent video of David Goggins where he jumps into this body of water with handcuffs behind his arms. <laughs> And he does he he jumps in and he keeps swimming deeper oh, and deeper. He doesn't come back. He, I just sit there. I'm starting to sweat. Yeah. I, I, he's just, he is really, uh, he is really the, uh, the pinnacle of discipline. Yeah. Uh, to a point of fast. torture is what it sounds yes. like to me. Like his running his everything. It's to a point of torture. <laughs> to the running. Yeah. <laughs> He'll sit there and make videos and he's like, how come some of you listen to music while you're running? That's cheating. You can't listen to music. You should just run. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's, a, oh, he's an yeah. incredible, incredible man. Yeah, he really is. Incredible is, I guess, the best word to describe him. Yeah. I think he actually lives, uh, I, I know. Vegas. Is he in Vegas now? Okay. Uh, I know his, mo I his so. mom is uh, in, in around Tennessee or in Tennessee oh. and around Nashville oh, yeah. where I am. So I see. Yeah. I see. Fascinating, man. Reggie Ford, what motivates you? That's funny. Uh, <laughs> I say funny because 
in in college or in, in business school actually uh we had a, a a public speaking course it was it was like a two-week course it was real quick but uh i ended up getting the best grade in that class and i was super proud of that because i've always nice. like, prior to that i was very shy all of this is new being able to communicate and tell my story and talk like like i am is, is fairly new and in that class we did a elevator pitch and instead of delivering the elevator pitch like a resume, like everybody else did, I, I, I said, um, my name is Reggie Ford, but you can call me Ford Mustang. Not hmm. because I'm a big, fast, strong muscle car, but because I'm driven. And to understand who I am, you have to understand what drives me. And so in that, I said, my, my motivator, this was, let's go back, you know, almost 10 years. So I, I think, again, things have evolved. but family was number one, you know, for the family that I currently have and for the future family that I hope to have. Um, that is, that is my number one driver to see that they don't have to endure the same things that I had to endure, um, to alleviate a lot of the things that have already been experienced. That's, that's number one. Um, competition was my number two. Hmm. And I don't know if I, if I will say that's still my number two. Uh, I think the, the sports me and the not at, how do I want to phrase that? Um, the more unhealthy version of me was a very competitive person. And I think out of insecurity, which is strange. And so, um, I think I'm going to, I'm going to stick to, I'm going to stick to, to family. Uh, the third one, in case anybody's wondering is, uh, people telling me I can't. And again, I think uh, that was, that was like, I want to prove everybody wrong who said I couldn't do mm. this. Uh, even the statistics who don't talk to me directly, but I'm, I'm the one that was born to a 14 year old mother. I'm the one whose father was a gang banger, drug dealer in prison. I'm the one I'm going to break all of that. You told me I couldn't and I'm going to do it. I'm the 5'9", 165-pound cornerback who plays in the SEC. Yes, I, I'm going to do all that. And so I think a lot of it uh, came from, you know, just what I, what, what I would consider insecurities because I, I knew – now I know where I was coming from with those things. Uh, and now it's, 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 I think it's about healing. Motivation – my motivation is healing for myself and healing for, mm. for the world. And that comes in many different forms. Um, healing, you know, racial divides, healing internal pains, healing, uh, you know, all different types of relationships. And so uh, that's what drives me. Great, great answer. And you kind of alluded to this at one point earlier in the conversation, but how do you measure success at this point in time? Yeah. Um, my success is measured on... Um, the, I think we only know what, we're the only people who know what is going on on the inside of us. And so I've had, you know, I've been recognized as, as, you know, high achiever in different regards and things like that. And none of those things have made me happier, right? The things that make me happy are, are sitting on the back porch with my wife, my best friend, you know, with some food around, uh, playing with the dog, listening to music things like that. And so I measure success as those, those moments, um, the, the, how can I be happy? Right. And I've one financially, it took, it took being able to buy a house. It took a, being able to be, you know, secure in that regard. So I don't discount wealth or money, um, completely, but I don't, that's not my ultimate end goal. It has no dollar sign attached to it. It's about how can I enjoy the moments? How can I find true peace and happiness while I'm here? Because we tell a lot of people to rest in peace, but very few people, I think, live in peace. Mm. Mm. Well, I want to soak that in for yeah. a moment. Very, very well said. Yeah. yeah. I'll repeat that. I'll look. What did I say? Yeah. <laughs> we tell a lot of people to rest in peace, but I think very few people live in peace. Yeah. Yeah, it is true, it's especially in our society where everything's so quick and everything is just instant gratification. Yeah. It's going on to the next and this FOMO and um, it's very tough. And, you know, 
sitting with your family and just having some food and some music around, just soaking that in is really, is really everything. And just, you know, when I just said those words, I took a deep breath, mm -hmm. you know, just if somebody's hearing that, hopefully they'll, they'll, their body will react. Yeah. Maybe just slow that heartbeat down a little Absolutely. bit, you know, and, you know, and, and do some meditation and do some yoga and, and, do some things that are uncomfortable that uh, make you more comfortable. Yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, I, I recently took up jujitsu. I, I, I'm so uncomfortable with it. I, 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 I can't say I love it yet, but I'm very uncomfortable with it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's finding angles with bodies mm -hmm. and I'm just, I've never done anything <laughs> like this before, but I keep doing it because I'm uncomfortable with yes. it and I'm going to get more comfortable with it. And you have to keep learning Reggie, just like we talked about. And, uh, you know, not everything should, you know, every discipline should be just easy. We, we, we should learn to do difficult things yeah. and, and move forward and keep growing. Reggie Ford, what an absolute honor. I, 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 when, when I saw that you accepted this, uh, I was very excited. Uh, I, I love learning more about you. Your public speaking is excellent. I encourage people to go to your YouTube, read your book. Uh, how can we get in touch with you? Let's talk about your website and some of the ways. Absolutely. So if you want to send me a message, you can do so at Reggie D, that's D as in dog, ReggieDFord.com. Um, find a contact page and, 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 and reach out to me. I'll be responding to that. Um, you can follow me on all the socials at Reggie D Ford. And yes, if, uh, uh, if you are so obliged, please, please, please get the book. It is, it, we didn't even, you know, get into the mean potatoes of it here, but, uh, it is centered around mental health and social justice. As I tell my story from childhood to now and, and the things that I've done throughout my life, um, interacting with, millions and millions of different people from all walks of life and and bringing what i've learned to to the masses with with the book um i am always available for speaking engagements so if you your organization want me to come out and deliver a message i would love to discuss that as well so reggie d ford wherever you are searching absolutely and reggie is r-e-g-g-i-e -G -G -E d forward and it's uh the website and of course all of uh instagram and twitter and uh linkedin reggie thank you so much for your time i hope one day uh you know your your beautiful wife and your dog we can all get together have a cup of coffee down there in nashville if i'm in the area i'll certainly let you know and uh i look forward to eventually meeting you face to face i appreciate it joey thank you so much you be well you too Thank you for listening and or viewing Joey Pinn's Discipline Conversations. Please share this episode with one or two of your friends who you think may benefit from the episode. Our website, www.joeypins.com. There you find lots of resources and you could join our mailing list. Please follow us on all our social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Podcast information, the video version of our podcast is on YouTube. Please subscribe. Audio is on all major podcasting platforms. Please follow them. And if you like it, please consider giving five-star rating. Would really appreciate that. Would you like to financially support the podcast? You can go to our Patreon site. Consider five, ten, or twenty dollars a month. There's all kind of plans that we have there. It's like a one-time payment. What is this podcast episode worth to you? $25, $50, $100, $500, $1,000, $5,000. You be the judge. You can go to our PayPal account to do that as well. Thank you again for listening or watching Joey Pinn's Discipline Conversations.